I just kind of kept going. All right. So here we are. So if you miss class, you're going to like have to pause me and write down everything. So the difference between the solid liquid gas is solids and liquids have strong attractions. We're going to talk about that. And gases are moving. They're jiggling, wiggling, and they have very weak attraction. Uh, we're doing the changes in state. So uh, gas coming back to the liquid is condensation or condensing. And the liquid going back to the solid would be freezing. So there's two more. We can skip the liquid. So if a solid, if you have just the right pressure and just the right temperature, you skip that state. Does anybody remember what the name of that is? The word? Sublimate. It is. So it's sublime or sublimate, sublimation. Um, the word sublime, it's really sublime. Um, so a solid never gets wet. That's why dry ice is called dry ice because it doesn't get wet. It skips, it goes through sublimation. And then the other direction, again, not getting wet. This is just as an example. This is what snow is. Uh, if the temperature this so over the weekend, if you're up on Mount Hood, it was snowing apparently. Um, not today, but uh, there's a lot of snow up there. Uh, this is called, does anybody remember? It's depositing a solid out of thin air, so deposition. All right, one more question here. Is it exo or endo? So what does exothermic mean? Heat. Yeah, that you're releasing heat or losing heat. And endo means into, so absorbing heat. So hopefully you all know that. Hopefully that's one of the pieces. So absorbing heat is going, um, I guess I should do it. The absorbing heat is the purple going in the forward direction. Uh, and exothermic was going in the reverse direction here. So condensation is exothermic. You're actually giving off heat to the surrounding. All right, dihydrogen monoxide is special for more reasons than I could put here. It is the molecule of our life. Um, a lot of the special has to do with that bond angle. So we have the oxygen in the middle. And so it has that bent. And also that it is very polarized. So we're going to see a special category when we get to the second page on this one. Um, in terms of states of matter, uh, something that is unique, and I'm pretty sure of all the natural substances, uh, this is the only one. The liquid is denser than the solid. So almost every substance, the solid is a regular pattern. And so you pack it together really tight, um, like it's showing here into a glob. Uh, and then the liquid, there's space in between because it's flowing. And then gases, of course, have lots of space in between. Um, so the liquid is denser than the solid. And the reason for that has to do with the shape. Um, because of the shape, it can stack up like this as the liquid. So it can still flow, but it stacks. So it can get actually really close together. Um, so this is H2O as a liquid. As a solid, uh, H2O makes a regular pattern and you get like these beehive hexagons, sorry. And so because of that, uh, the regular pattern has has holes. And so from a biological standpoint, we say this is great. So, so liquid solid water floated and allowed life to develop underneath whatever. Um, but anyway, that gives it holes, which is unusual for solids. Uh, a lot of solids are made to mimic this. So the idea of styrofoam. So there's a lot of things that are much um, have low density solids.
it has to do when you have a low density solid like pumice. Um, there's there's a lot of gaps holes in there, so there's air in there. All right, one more thing with our state phases is this is a phase diagram, and it's showing this one's nicely labeled. So solid liquid gas, or over here solid liquid gas. This is the triple point. And the triple point is where all three phases exist at the same time. Um, now, this is CO2. And if you look for, um, this is pressure. And we're going to talk about pressure uh, probably next week, not today, uh, and temperature. But you're, you have to get to an extremely low pressure to get to the triple point for water. But if you look at it for CO2, a pressure of five that's huge uh, so regular atmospheric pressure is one and so we're at a really high pressure here to get to that point and so if we're here at room temperature that's what the dots are showing that's here um, and so that's why co2 is going to go between the solid and gas and it never forms into the liquid state we have to get to a higher pressure and that has to do with the shape of the co2 we have to get to a higher pressure to push it um, into the liquid. All right. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot more to these diagrams than we're going to talk about. There is a point called the critical point, and beyond that, um, or on some of them, it it seems to be called something different every couple months. But beyond that, you don't have phases. Uh, there are more than three. There's nine phases of matter now, and they seem to be adding new ones all the time. Um, yeah, so these are the three we're going to worry about, but um, there are, I think I was listening to a thing that physics has now come up with nine phases. So one of them is plasma, which is in like the stars, uh, which is just the delocalized nuclei. Um, but beyond this point, when you get beyond that temperature and pressure, it's it's not existing as these three phases. We've moved into other phases. Uh, that's not going to happen here in our household at this moment. So, all right. The other thing that's unique about water, since we're talking about water, um, is pretty much every natural substance. The graph looks more like this, and it's hard to see. This is not the best one because this, well, I guess it is. Uh, that the slope of this line, this, this line has a positive slope between the solid and liquid because the solid is the densest. So as you, as you pick a temperature and you increase the pressure, you will move into the solid state. Uh, for water, this line has a negative slope. And that is because the liquid is the densest. That's what I was talking about up there. All right. Any questions? I went through that page pretty fast, but we'll come, we'll look at, um, we'll do a page like this again to make sure uh, this, this piece up here, as we keep adding and learning about each state, of matter and why um, water is so special um, that this will make sense. I, I usually do it at the end, um, and so we'll look at it again, but it is the difference between the states of matter is what gives each one its properties. And, and you actually know these things, right? That liquids flow. Um, gases have a lot of space between them. So they're mostly, that's another thing you can add to gases. They're mostly empty space. But I want to remind you when you go into space, there's more empty space in every atom in your body than there is in space. Um, but it's not actually empty. That's where all the potential is happening. All right. So this is not on your celebration. Thank you. Nobody asked me that. Uh, somebody was probably thinking it. Uh, this will be on celebration two. So celebration two will be about solid liquids and gases. Um, the celebration this week, we'll do a review in. Uh, probably about 20 minutes. So uh, this is for study set five, which is next Tuesday. 
was Tuesday, uh, is about intermolecular forces. And it, it determines if you're a solid, liquid, or gas. which is and other properties of it. Um, so it is always abbreviated IMF and it stands for intermolecular forces. So the best diagram on here to show you this is right here with the water molecule. Inside the water molecule, those are covalent bonds. That is what this midterm, the celebration is about, is drawing the molecules. What we're going to move into is the attraction between molecules. And so you can see there, those, those are the IMFs. And they are always shown with dots. And what they are, in two words, is intermolecular forces are an electrostatic attraction. So electrostatic means positive, negative. Um, attraction. So we have a positive somewhere attracting to a negative. So chemistry, there's several forces in nature that we believe in, um, doesn't matter if they're true or not. Uh, and the one chemistry really focuses on is the electrostatic positive and negative. It's, it's that whole duality um, that we can take, thank uh, Descartes for introducing duality and everything. Um, so we start with ionic. Again, this is, I'm used to having the huge chalkboard and so, which I'll have again eventually. Uh, ionic, you guys already know, ionic is going to be a metal and a non-metal. So when we see from two different sides of the periodic table, um, and the metal is the cation, so it's a positive, and the non-metal is negative. This, this is going to be our strongest um, because we have a true positive and negative. All right. Um, now we're going to skip. We're going to skip down to dipole, dipole. And the reason for that, we're going to write something with the H bond. H bond stands for hydrogen bond. And an H bond is an extreme dipole. So to understand that, we, we're going to skip down to dipole, dipole, and then we're going to come back. With this chart, with this, the order I put them in is showing from strongest to weakest. Um, so the extreme dipole is stronger than a regular dipole. Uh, dipole, dipole, just it's going to happen when you have a polar to a polar. And it's an attraction. The easiest one to show it with is HCl. So that's a covalent bond, right? That's sharing electrons. And another HCl. So the key here is this term intermolecular. So inter means there's two molecules and it's the attraction between two molecules. So we can add that to our definition, electrostatic attraction between two molecules um, or between two particles. So I have to make a quick disclaimer. Um, I don't like the term IMF because it implies everything is a molecule and um, molecules are only things that have covalent bonds. So ionic is not technically a molecule. Um, unfortunately, so I started calling them interparticle forces, interparticular forces, and it didn't catch. And so I eventually got rid of calling them that and went back to what everything calls it. It was pretty much once Google and YouTube took off and everything on there is IMFs. Um, you may run into an IPF question somewhere, and that, that means IMF. It just You would only run into that in my class. I, I attempted to change the world. Um, right. All right. Remember when we showed the positive? This is something you've seen me do. 
Uh, the hydrogen has the area of positivity. This is very different from ionic, where you have a full positive and a full negative. The electrons have transferred. This is just an area of positivity or negativity. But on our second molecule, we also have an area of positive and an area of negative. So this goes back to the study set. And you've seen this question keep showing up on the study set where I have you guys show the negative and the positive areas or it asks that. Those negatives and positives are going to attract just like they do with ionic. They're just not as strong. And so we show it always with dots. It's always going to be a positive for a negative. So anything that's polar um, is a dipole dipole. They repeat themselves um, because it's between two polar molecules. I'm just going to call it dipole. Um, some students will call it a dip dip. That's kind of up to you. So we're going to take a step back. We're going to do an extreme dipole. And the extreme dipole, remember Knopf? Oh, I was going to wear my gnome hat today. Dang it. Um, I remember next Tuesday. You know, all the sunshine working in your garden makes you think about other stuff. So I put a little G in front of this. So Noth is the hat that the gnome wears. Oh, I have one here. Always prepared, right? Here we go. They're always pointy. They don't have to be pointy. Um, so nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. What's special about those three? Know this for your midterm, for your celebration. They're very greedy. They are very greedy. These are the greediest of them all. Right, so periodic table on the wall. Who's the greediest of them all? So that corner, N, O, and F. It is when they are connected to a hydrogen covalently, so a hydrogen to N, O, or F makes an extremely polarized bond. The hydrogen always gets the positive, and these guys will get the negative. And this picture shows it beautifully. So the oxygen has the negative, and it's going to have an attraction to the positive on another water molecule. Um, to the hydrogen. And so we get this whole network. And if you actually look back on this page, oh, it doesn't show it, but that's that's what I was talking about. So with the liquid, there are these attractions. And that's why when you walk through water, you can fill the water because molecules are close to each other and you're pushing them apart. When you're walking through the air in the room, you don't fill all the molecules in the room because there's so much space between them. You do feel them when you go outside today because it's such a windy day. Um, and so the wind is moving the molecules past you. All right. Um, so that's H bond. Water is going to have H bond because it has a hydrogen attached to an oxygen. Uh, so the last one, I just call them London forces because they were hypothesized at London College. Uh, they are also known, you do need to know the other names in case you run into them, um, as dispersion forces. And they are also known as van der Waal forces. Uh, in biology, they still seem to go, that was the name of the guy from London College who came up with the idea of the dispersion forces, but van der Waal forces. Um, most people don't talk about them as van der Waal forces because this idea wasn't quite right, but this happens in all neutral particles. Um, so something that has hydrogen bonds also has London forces. It's just 99.9% .9 is the hydrogen bond, so we ignore the London. Same with dipole. Ions do not. So the key is that you have to be neutral. Where we're only going to see these is something that is nonpolar. 
um, or an atom. And this picture actually shows it really nice. So remember the center of our atom is the nucleus. So that's the central sun. That's where all of our potential, there's so much energy there. And the electrons are out there with their pulses. Uh, what happens in the dispersion is you get this momentary dispersion where the electrons are all to one side of the nucleus. So if we had two atoms of argon and you have the nucleus in the center and the nucleus is positive, right, in the center, and you have a momentary dispersion of the electrons to one side, you are going to have this attraction between the electrons of one atom for the nucleus of the next atom. It is extremely weak. I should put that in another color. Um, because it's, it, it's very momentary, very, very momentary. It's like a moment. How long is a moment? You know, in, in most languages, it's something we lack in this language. When they really want to emphasize something, they repeat the word. So like in Nepali, if somebody's really tall, they say tulo tulo. So tall, tall. Um, I don't know how tall any of you are. And so I'm not, I'm not a tulo tulo. I'm not even a tulo. Ong is little. So I'd be an ong ong. The gnomes, little, little. Um, however, if you get enough of these, and this only is in London, you can do a lot with them. Um, and so if you get enough surface area as you increase surface area, so tulo tulo surface area, uh, this becomes significant. You increase the London and it can actually become mightier than the ones up above. This is how geckos walk up the wall. So it is not like Spider-Man. Spider-Man actually had some kind of substance that he shot out of his webbed hand, whatever. Uh, geckos, actually, they've studied them and there's nothing. There's no sticky stuff. If they look at them under an electron microscope, they're little paws. I don't know what do they call them. I guess paws. They have all these indentations. There's like all this valleys and hills uh, and it's all by London dispersion forces and they can walk up walls. And so if you travel to other countries um, that are like equatorial, you will have geckos singing to you at night and geckos in your shower. And they're awesome. I love them. I, a lot of people freak out. And and you, you always have that choice in life. You can freak out about stuff or you embrace it. Like I'm embracing the fact that they have banned us from campus in the summer. But we can all go to like Oaks Park this weekend. You know, Oaks Park is opening this weekend in, Mal in the heart of Multnomah County. That's the best of it. Um, but uh, we'll figure something out eventually maybe we can have a big potluck at oaks park because it's open that's what we'll do we can we can do that at the end of the term all right there is one more that's at the top and i put it there um this is not an imf uh the worksheet for next week for tuesday there's a 15 minute video you watch and it will help you to fill out the worksheet, and it gives a practical example of these. It's a lab we used to do, um, and it talks about this. This is something like diamonds or sand. Um, this is all covalent bonds. In a diamond, every carbon atom is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms. It is, there's no intermolecular forces. So these are not IMFs. I mentioned this because this is actually a huge point of IMFs. IMFs are just attractions. And we're going to talk about it and I'll say ionic is huge and H bonds are huge. There is no comparison to sharing the electrons. So a covalent bond is like your arm attached to your shoulder. You cannot jiggle and giggle your arm off. You can jiggle and giggle and laugh as much as you want. You might fall on the floor, 
but your arms and your legs are still attached to your body. If you are holding hands and you start laughing, especially do this with kids, because kids laugh really good. They still know how to laugh. You will eventually lose holding on to the hands because you're laughing so hard. Uh, and that's what this is. This attraction, if you increase, we'll do it here. If you increase uh, the kinetic energy, the jiggles, you will break, you will overcome, you will lose the IMFs. So this attraction in between, and it's going to become a gas. Um, you lose the attraction between them. They just have too much chaos going on. And a covalent bond, you can't. The water molecule stays how it is. It's just not attracted to other water molecules. And that's what a gas is. Uh, network covalent, it's all covalent. There's nothing you can do to it. And so that's why sand, that's why diamond's the hardest substance on the planet. Um, or anything is going to be that hard. It's going to be all covalent bonds. So that's going to be a solid. And I talk about them in the video that goes with the worksheet. All right. So we're going to play this little game. And we're going to identify in each pair the types of intermolecular force. And then we're going to pick the one that's stronger. And so when you do the study set for next Tuesday, um, You'll just come back and look at this. And so the first page is just comparing them. And I think the second page is some of the stuff of states of matter. All right. Um, and then the worksheet, there's going to be, it's a short video. It is only 15 minutes. It's why I'm not going to remake it, because I don't think I can make it in 15 minutes again. So um, these guys are nonpolar. If they are nonpolar, we're telling, we're saying, oh, which one has the stronger IMF? So they're both London. If they are both London, somebody always wins, by the way. See, you never, you're not going to end up with a tie. They're both London. You look for the higher surface area. Meaning, which one of these is larger? Well, thankfully, I have this. And we're comparing bromine and chlorine. Bromine's larger. It's lower down on the periodic table. So bromine's going to win. Oh, sorry. It's bromine and fluorine. It's bromine really wins there. This is not an H-bond for fluorine because there's no hydrogen. H-bond, you have to have the hydrogen. So if it's just fluorine to fluorine, it's nonpolar. All right. On the next one. See that nitrogen followed by a hydrogen? As soon as you see that, this is the only thing you get from this lecture. That's an H bond. This is one of the big take home things from the term. H bonds are special. H bonds like water because water has H bonds. Um, this one is polar. So why is the first one, the HCN, not an H bond. There is a hydrogen and there is a nitrogen, but it's not an H bond. Is it because the hydrogen will uh, connect with the carbon and not the nitrogen? Yeah, the carbon's there in the middle. And so an H bond, the hydrogen has to be on the NOF. So it has to be attached to the NOF. Um, and so the H bond wins. You don't have to tell me, when I say explain briefly, if you say polar, polar is dipole. Um, so the hierarchy here. So if you tell me what they each have, the stronger intermolecular force is going to win. Um, this is, again, why I had you do the organic lab. When you look at this, this is saying there's three hydrogens on the carbon, and then there's a nitrogen with two hydrogens. I'm going to go ahead and draw it out just because it might help some students. Uh, and then nitrogen with its hydrogen. And a reminder, and that was another thing that happens in the organic video, a lot of times they don't show the dots on the nitrogen, but that is a hydrogen bond. The HCN, um, as Christian correctly said, is there is a triple bond. Um, there is a carbon in between the hydrogen and nitrogen. So there is a pool towards the nitrogen, this is just a bigger pool. 
So the NH makes it special. All right, the next one. Handy dandy periodic table. Cesium is way over here. Chlorine's way over there. We have a metal and a non-metal. This is an ion. That's going to win. And this diamond was present. Uh, we're going to classify the other one. So another big message. Carbon makes how many bonds always? Four. So what this is saying is you have a carbon with three hydrogens. You don't have to draw it. The hope is, is that you get to a point where you see it. And then you have the chlorine. This is polar because of the chlorine. The chlorine would be pulling. So we would say it's a dipole. So you don't have to draw Lewis structures. I'm doing them because you have a celebration in two days. And so it's good practice. All right. Ionic winds. Again, it's the hierarchy of this. Um, highest, strongest to weakest. All right. This is nonpolar. This was one of the big messages from the organic video. How do you know? How do I know just looking at that? It's nonpolar. This is nonpolar because it's only carbons and hydrogens. We don't see anything greedy to pull. Um, so this is London. The other one's got the oxygen. The oxygen's going to win. <laughs> um, carbons and hydrogens don't pull. We've talked about that. Uh, this is a dipole. It is not an H bond. Why is it not an H bond? Because the O is not on the H. Is on the C. Yeah, the H's are on the carbon. Again, that was the other big reason for doing the organic lab is so as we move on, we're going to run into these molecules that you want to be able to look at them and see what they are without having to draw them. I am going to draw it out just for the heck of it. Uh, but this is a carbon with carbon makes four bonds. It has the hydrogens. Then we have an oxygen. Then we have another carbon with three hydrogens. So we write the hydrogens after what it's attached to. Uh, the oxygen, though, would have dots, and so this would have a bent. That was a question on the first lab. Uh, the dots on the oxygen, you can draw it however you want, but it's a tetrahedral bent. And so there is a pull for the oxygen. All right, the next ones are only carbons and hydrogens. Right, so they're both nonpolar. If they're both nonpolar, you look at surface area. So they both are one, two, three, four carbons. But what's different is the shape. This one is going to be, the first one's going to be the zigzags. And the second one's going to just be like that, like a little Y. So this one has the higher surface area. because it just does the zigzags the whole way across. Um, and again, that's that's why that organic lab, it helps you um, just kind of follow along. There's a video, it's an hour and a half long video. Uh, follow along with the video, you fill it out, and the people who've done it have done pretty well with it, so. All right, the last one. You key into the OHs. That one has a ho and an O. When an OH is written on the left side, we write it as a HO. When we write it on the right side, we write it as an O. So this one has one H bond. This one has two H bonds. So with, they're both H bonds. Two is always better than one. So two H bonds. So for reasons, that's all you have to say. Questions. All right, so I'm going to pause this.